Good day, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our webinar today. Today, we are delighted to have you all with us in order to celebrate 20 years for Pharmacy Education Journal. So we hope you will enjoy our webinar. Our webinar will be a mix of celebration and science. So allow me to introduce myself and Shirley Melianti. I am Marwan Ael. I am FIP Projects Manager for Workforce Development, Evidence and uh, Impact. And I'm the Journal Editor for Pharmacy Education Journal. I'm on introducing also our co-moderator, Shirley Melianti. Shirley is FIP Data and Intelligence Specialist, and she's the Managing Editor for our journal. So together, Shirley and I will be moderating the session today. We start by some announcements. This webinar will be recorded and live streamed via YouTube, and the recording will be available on our website at www.events.fip.org. You may ask questions using the question box provided, so please feel free to send us your questions in the Q&A uh, box, and you're welcome to provide feedback to us after our webinar at webinars at fip.org. If you're here and you're still not a member at FIP, and you wish to join us, please become a member by visiting www.fip.org and going to the membership registration in order to become a member. We're happy to have uh, our speakers with us today. We'll be having Professor Ian Bates, Professor Shane Dessel, Professor Lillian Azapordi, Professor Judelin uh, Solidum, Associate Professor Rudy Hendra and Adjunct Professor Jennifer Mario. We will be uh, going with you over different aspects and uh, hopefully our webinar will be showing you all what we're doing and how we are today celebrating 20 years for PAJ. So uh, follow us on our social media and publish with us. So our Twitter is farmed underscore journal. And if you wish to use the hashtag publish with PAJ and 20 years PAJ. With it as our website at pharmacyeducation.fip.org. So today's program will go over the 20 years of PAJ, what we have done and what we'll be doing, the importance of publishing in pharmaceutical workforce field. We will give you some steps from submission to publication. And of course, we will provide you with some tips as authors. We will reflect, we will have reflections from our reviewers and editors. And also, we will have the perspective from special issues. So our learning objective will be to showcase what we did achieve during the 20 years and how what we achieved was done, to, prevent, to present for you new plans for PAJ, to highlight the importance of publishing, to explain the steps from submission to publication. So what happens behind the screen and who does it? And of course, we'll be providing you some tips as uh, you are, if you are wishing to uh, submit uh, your work to our journal or any other journal. So we will start by our uh, presentation by welcoming our CEO, FIP CEO, Catherine Duggan, who will be addressing some words for the celebration of the 20 years of PAJ. Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Marwan. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, delighted to be here with you for a few minutes ahead of the main event. So I just wanted to say a few words really in recognition, in celebration, and then about the importance of the PEJ. I sometimes think the whole entire purpose of FIP is to celebrate the greatness, to build on the strengths and to prepare us for the future. And I think PEJ is an example of that. There was some visionary leadership at the time, and I pay testament to um, Cam Middell, our past president, and to Ian, who's on the call, the uh, webinar with us today, to identify the importance of having a journal that can share good practice, that can share evidence, and that can progress the profession with that evidence to improve uh, the services that our profession delivers, the education our profession delivers, and indeed to actually advanced pharmacy worldwide, which is our three word uh, mission. 
There's something about having a journal in place which allows peers to uh, review, challenge, promote, and then to learn from the published work. And I will leave it to the rest of the webinar for you to walk through some of those successes. But I also want to say that when the PEJ was launched some 20 years ago, it really started the evidence base around education. And education is the underpinning of our profession. Without a good basis in pharmacy education, we cannot deliver the professional uh, mandate that we have for patients and the public. And when I think about the commitments we've made to the Astana Declaration to secure the position of pharmacy uh, globally, from pharmaceutical science all the way through to practice and public health, to make sure we're part of the primary health care agenda to deliver universal health coverage. We need to be able to build and learn from evidence of the past. We also need countries which are setting up new services to be able to learn from countries that have done it and even to innovate further. We've committed that we will be hosting a health minister summit next year. If we didn't have the wealth of work from the PEJ, and from all the publications that you, the profession, has have published in our journal, we would be much, much further behind in being able to persuade, to influence and to demonstrate impact with evidence. So I'm delighted for you um, that you can just take a moment, take a pause in your day to think about the 20 years. I'm delighted that this work was initiated when it was because it has held us in very good stead to meet 2020s head on. And as we have expanded the scope and the breadth of the Pharmaceutical Workforce Development Goals launched in 2016 to incorporate all of our profession in the 21 Development Goals launched in 2022, so we see the scope, the reach and the breadth of PEJ expanding and growing. I really pay testament to all of you. Thank you so much for the support for the journal. Thank you so much for publishing in the journal. And thank you so much for taking time today to celebrate the journal. I look forward to hearing more in the event. And thanks so much, Marwan, Shirley, and Ian for the work on the journal with your teams. Thanks a million. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you for your words. We will start our presentations. Shirley? Uh, thank you, Marwan, and thank you, uh, Catherine, as well, for the words. Um, uh, it is an honor for me, actually, to um, introduce our editor-in-chief, Pharmacy Education Journal, Professor Ian Bates. I suppose most of you uh, may already know him. Um, he is the chair of pharmacy education at the UCL School of Pharmacy, and he is also the editor-in-chief of Pharmacy Education Journal. And he is currently also a director um, of FIP Global Pharmaceutical Obser Observatory. And uh, Prof. Bates, um, I welcome you in this floor. and. Um, Feel free to open your camera now and um, uh, and uh, feel free to um, inform us about how, um, how what we have done in uh, pharmacy education journal across 20 years and what we will do for the next next step in the future. Prof, uh, Prof Bates, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Shirley, uh, for that. I promise I won't take up a lot of time uh, because uh, the uh, in interesting people uh, are coming after me uh, and uh, I I'm just going to give a little overview um, of where we've come from because um, the slide that, uh, uh, there we go, this slide here sort of highlights the fact that the conception and launch uh, of the journal is, was at the beginning of, the, of this millennium. Uh, we're, we're calling this a 20 year celebration, approximately uh, is the uh, word in brackets after, after it. We, we, we did launch in the year 2000 um, and it took, uh, as with all new big ventures like this, it took a couple of years to stabilize. So I'm still quite happy to call this a 20 uh, year uh, event that we're having this morning. Um, let me pay acknowledgement to uh, the, the, if you like, the existing journals, not quite ready yet for this slide, Shirley. All right, thank you. Let me just pay a tribute to the existing journals at the time, the American Journal of uh, Pharmaceutical Education, which was really the only one that was having a, a focus on uh, educational uh, research in, in our field. 
And uh, the feeling at a time, certainly on, on the other side of the Atlantic, if you like, was that there was a need and a space for an additional uh, focus, I think. Something with a slightly more international flavor. Uh, if if uh, my um, AGPE colleagues don't mind me saying that. Uh, and that was the idea uh, to begin with. And I was supported in this by my mentor, uh, my old mentor at the time, who was a dean of the School of Pharmacy, Professor Sandy Florence, who um, was so very supportive uh, for me and for many others as well, and uh, suggested this idea to me following a meeting of the European associations of faculties of pharmacy who immediately became uh, a supporter of the idea. And it's lovely to have Lillian on the call today, um, both representing her extreme uh, expertise as well as representing EAFP, who were uh, very much um, uh, big supporters, foundation, foundating uh, uh, um, uh, association for this journal. It was a big job, actually. Um, and I look back now with a, a wry smile on my face about the barriers we had to overcome, all those business uh, plans we had to keep writing and rewriting. We did find a publisher, a small publisher in Holland called Harwood, who within a year of us launching uh, the journal were overtaken or taken over by Taylor and Francis. And as you can see on the screen there, we had a very fancy abstract uh, cover because uh, we're talking about hard copy back in those days. The internet had been invented. We were emailing each other and we, have, we had moderately functional mobile phones, although they were quite expensive, I seem to recall. Uh, but the journals were still hard cover at the time. And that was an expense. And we were always struggling with the finances, I think, until we were eventually rescued by um, technology uh, and we became more online uh, and cheaper to run. And I'm, I'm saying, uh, uh, sort of emphasizing the costs a little bit because we started out with a principle of we're not charging anything for this journal. Um, and we're trying to hang on to that principle uh, now, 20 years later, we're still not trying to charge people uh, for publishing. And uh, there's a very good reason for that, as I'll uh, show you in just a moment. So my thanks to those people uh, who helped launch this Millennium uh, Journal. Thank you, Lillian. And uh, thank you also, Shane DeSalle, who's on the call with us today. RSAP publish a fair amount of workforce and educationally related material. And I have absolutely no issues at all with that. But Shane has been very helpful in as a guiding light, as someone who's super experienced with the world of academic publishing. And we cohabit, I think, uh, a very good shared space uh, between us. So let me thank you, Shane, uh, before you come on later on for the uh, uh, help and support and guidance you've always given us for our little journal, uh, which is now published exclusively by FIP as a professional uh, leadership uh, journal. Uh, um, and thank you to FIP for supporting uh, the cost. It is a costly business actually publishing even in these uh, digital times. And uh, my thanks to FIP uh, for incorporating um, uh, this as part of the mission uh, of this organization. It was a precursor to many things, actually. Um, Brazil, 2006, we first, then we first met with WHO Human Resources for Health and had a first formal um, symposium, mini symposium with uh, Human Resources for Health at the time and started to shape a new mission for FIP, which was about education, training, development, and workforce and a realization that these aspects, in addition to the science of pharmacy and the medicines expertise of pharmacy, were going to be critical. And I, I'm, I'm glad to say we were, we were 
good with that view that has turned out to be critical. And as we know now in the year 2022, one of the chief challenges of healthcare provision, pharmaceutical healthcare provision is developing the workforce. Um, there is no pharmaceutical healthcare delivery without having a workforce behind it. And if we want to continue pushing forwards with these global health challenges and being a primary provider in primary healthcare communities and secondary care communities, we have to keep reshaping, remodeling, advancing the workforce. And that is called education and training. So in a way, this was the start of something which has grown into a huge big thing now. Um, AM, AJPE and other journals uh, are also focusing on uh, education and training as a primary research target. And I'm super, super happy to see that happening, that we do have multiple outlets now for researchers, particularly younger researchers, younger faculty, to start their careers publishing in this area of, of uh, education, training, development and workforce. I'm super happy to see that. So good, let's just have a couple of slides about where we are from a um, statistical point of view, just to show you some trends that have happened over the last 20 years. Um, th this was uh, a, a mid teens uh, slide, which I dug out of the archives. This was, uh, I think we developed this slide in 2015 or so. 2016, 17, when workforce was becoming to the fore, we were uh, uh, sort of saying, actually, it's really taking off now, this. So we stuck with it all that time and pushed and pushed, and it was really taking off. Where are we now? The next slide shows us that um, uh, the trends for it. Just move on for me, please, Shirley. Here we go. Uh, these are some archive stats. Let me just point out the blips in this uh, statistic. 2008, 2009, we had to move to another publisher during this time. We, uh, and we lost data. It was a traumatic period for the journal, I have to say. Uh, we did lose data. So 2008, 2009, I would ignore those two categories there. Um, 2018, 19, I'm afraid the same thing sort of happened again as we had to change our technology platform. Uh, so we try and ignore them as well. But the general trend here is an upwards one. The regression curve is going up. And there's a lot of people downloading articles and abstracts, a lot of people doing it, which I'm pleased, <laughs> very pleased to see. Um, it's a busy little website uh, we have going on with people searching and uh, downloading stuff right now. The next slide is quite interesting because it shows where we need to uh, help, um, uh, where we need continued support uh, with an upward trajectory. Um, you can see there the purple bars are articles published which are on an upward trend. 2022, that's uh, really only the first quarter of this year. Um, and I know from our stats that we've got a lot of papers in the pipeline uh, right now. And the next slide shows us some of the trends which have been going on. Um, first of all, upper left. The, the first language English speakers, uh, North America, your Western Pacific is, is the, uh, uh, Australia and New Zealand have been pushing out lots and lots of work there. It has to be said that the majority uh, of um, publications are coming out of those uh, regions, but increasingly uh, Eastern Mediterranean, uh, African, Southeast Asia are catching up. That figure there doesn't fully capture the current trends, uh, which are, uh, and the growth areas are in fact um, Eastern Mediterranean, Southeast Asia. Uh, they've got the biggest uh, growth trends right now, which is uh, very heartening to see. Articles about digital education, digitization of pharmacy education and workforce development, they've been on a steady 
increase as you can uh, imagine which is uh, also good to see uh, good to see the reality uh, of that taking place and the bigger picker the biggest picture on that slide there which is the one I, I might want to say a little bit more about is the is the international collaboration which we're beginning to see more and more of so multiple multi uh, multinational authors or transnational authorship of uh, papers is uh, definitely on an upward uh, trend, even more so. We haven't got the 2020-2021 data on there yet, but it continues with an upward uh, trajectory. And kind of like we are fulfilling our mission uh, objectives now, which on the next slide, I think, I put some word down, words down. Uh, about that. We, we started out with wanting to encourage young faculty, early career um, uh, practitioners to publish their work in education. And we really did have a big focus on it. And we continue to have an emphasis on authors who may not have English as their first language. We continue to do that, which slows us down a bit because we do take and pay particular attention um, to those uh, young faculty who don't have English um, oral or written as a first language, and we help them to get their papers through to uh, submission and publication. Um, in, in Because we are still in very much an English-speaking academic world uh, as we know it. So we maintain our push and our drive with that. And I think um, it's, 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 coming to fruition that we are really helping other WHO regions now, or authors in other WHO regions to uh, disseminate their uh, work. We don't charge, we have no uh, article processing uh, charges in the journal. It's entirely uh, subsidized by both FIP and by external um, uh, funds that we get coming in to help support the journal. These are um, uh, funds which are not linked to any uh, promotion or branding or anything like that. They are uh, educational funds to support this journal. We did have a big in injection of funds from WHO, in actual fact, Human Resources for Health, when we changed our uh, technology platform first time, which was a huge help in around 2012, 2013. So, uh, publication costs, as we all know, remain very much a barrier, and particularly in education, getting funds for educational research, getting external uh, awards for educational research remains very, very difficult indeed uh, for all academics in all parts of the world. And uh, having an additional publication charge for research work, I think, is still a bit of a barrier uh, to that. Um, we, we will maintain this, these two principles about supporting uh, young uh, scientists, and particularly those with, with non-English as a first language, and also uh, maintaining open access, golden open access, and no APCs for as long as we possibly can with the journal. There's a, there's a bit of a price to pay sometimes. We work based on volunteers. Um, and uh, the next slide shows, I think, some of our volunteers uh, coming up. Uh, it, it, oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, that, that'll be the slide after. Uh, but uh, that does enable us to, enab uh, enable us to maintain our um, uh, open access uh, status in the world. Well, one thing uh, we'd like to push out there today, which is new, is that we are thinking of broadening the scope of the journal. At the moment, we clearly have education workforce as keywords as part of our scope uh, in the journal. We'd like to try and link up practice and science a little bit more and to get more of a focus, if you like, on outcomes and more of a focus on how education works in practice, not just sort of in the classroom or in initial education training. So we are currently working through plans to have a second, if you like, thematic strand to the journal, uh, 
as a publication platform and inviting authors to try and link together those four words at the top there, education, workforce, practice, and science, into short manuscripts or enhanced abstracts, if you like. And in particular, we're looking at our practitioners, um, maybe people who are not academics, but are doing work on the ground in uh, education, training, and development to start disseminating their work in shortened manuscripts. So um, uh, pr providing another an opportunity, I think, with, a, uh, with um, uh, an easier barrier, if you like, or, or an easier challenge to get their work into practice. And we're hoping to be uh, launching uh, this new scoped theme uh, later on this year or in early 2023 in time for the ministerial summit that Catherine was talking about uh, earlier on. We hope as well that this would attract submissions from undergraduate and postgraduate researchers. So we know in many um, degree, in, in, if, if not most uh, initial education and training uh, degrees now around the world, students do short project work, um, uh, master's project, master's degree project work as well. And we hope that this might open up a dissemination platform for very early <laughs> um, career uh, practitioners to publish some of their degree work as well. Uh, I'm hoping that we can have a good discussion, maybe with IPSF and our uh, young pharmacist group at uh, FIP to gain their support uh, for this uh, um, proposal. Super good. Thank you, Shirley. Let's move on and let me pay tribute to uh, Marwan and Shirley who do a uh, a lot of work for keeping the journal going. Um, many of you on the call will perhaps understand the amount of admin <laughs> that goes into publication. It's a huge undertaking. So my thanks to Marwan and Shirley um, for doing such a great job uh, with FIP uh, for the publications and all our associate editors across our um, geographic regions as well. Let me show you some lovely pictures of all the people who are helping with us, with the editorial team. These are doing all the work like uh, proof reading, uh, typesetting, you know, even with our digital technologies now, there's a lot of uh, office work that needs doing. These are all very young, promising, aspiring stars in pharmacy, and we are very happy to give them uh, a little platform uh, to improve their CVs and to learn something about uh, academic and professional uh, publications. So thank you uh, to all of you uh, who help us as volunteers uh, in this endeavor that we have. Thank you, Shirley. Um, just a few little um, uh, notes there for you, about our uh, social media stuff and such like. Thank you all for listening to my ramblings uh, just now. And I hope uh, that we can have uh, at least another 20 years of continued growth and development uh, with this particular academic journal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Bates, and thank you for your guidance. We're so happy that we're working with you. And uh, we will go now to, and as you said, wishing another 20 years and even more for PAJ. Uh, we cannot do this without all the team and all the editors and associate editors and the reviewers that are with us. We thank them all. We will start by now by one of the associate editors that we would like to really show a high appreciation as we appreciate everyone with us, Professor Lillian Azapordi. Professor Azapordi will be talking about the importance of publishing in the pharmaceutical and workforce field. Um, Professor Azapordi is at the Department of Pharmacy at the Faculty of Medicine and Surgery at University of Malta. She's an associate editor with us at Pharmacy Education Journal. She's on the, on the editorial board for the Journal of the American College of Clinical Pharmacy, and she's the president of the European Association of Faculties of Pharmacy. Our collaboration with Professor Azapordi cannot be quantified. We're doing a lot together for PAJ. Thank you, Lillian, for that. The floor is yours. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marwan, for that very nice introduction. And uh, I'd like to thank Marwan, Cheryl, and Ian for uh, the invitation to join you today and also for um, the very nice collaboration that, that we have um, uh, linked also to the European Association of Faculties of Pharmacy. And following on um, the introduction by Catherine uh, earlier, I'd like to draw you back out of pharmacy and move into to the arts, um, where um, looking at an example from Van Gogh's uh, series of sunflower uh, artistic uh, presentations, where the artist is using medium, a medium, to depict the complexity and the texture of life um, through a very simple design, such as the one we have on the slide. And I'm using this uh, comparison to what has happened in pharmacy education journal and to what happens with publishing. Because I believe that um, Ian very nicely depicted the 20 year story of uh, pharmacy education journal and how at the time EAFP was also involved in the inception. And the idea is of bringing about the complexity and the texture of pharmacy education and how it can impact on the advancement and transformation of pharmacy to in a in a simple um, transmissible way through a medium which is the publishing uh, technology so this is um, i think the fulcrum of having um, the opportunity of all of us to have the opportunity to publish our work when to publish it what to publish and why we should be publishing. So if we move on to into the next slide, we can see an example of, uh, we are all very much uh, aware of uh, uh, evolvements in education. If we look at how pharmacy education in, in the United States evolved in the 70s, um, introducing the clinical pharmacy concept, which then spread into the, in the UK, Europe, um, Asia, and other parts of the world, we do understand and we do see that over the years, we have seen a number of evolvements in education. Uh, this is an example from data that we have from the European region, where we are seeing always the increase in medical sciences, clinical pharmacy, pharmaceutical care in the curricula. In the next slide, we can also appreciate that over the years in tandem, we have seen advancement in the profession um, in all settings, um, be it a pharmacist practicing in the direct patient care services, community or hospital settings, as well as in other areas which are more focusing on the product industry and the pharmaceutical regulation, whereby pharmacy, the pharmaceutical workforce is not today looking at keeping the patient at the center whilst navigating the transformations in the technology with biological drugs, with uh, uh, complex therapies, uh, as well as the digital platforms and the empowerment of patients. So in this context, therefore, we are seeing that um, we do have a, an obligation that we share these involvements and we bring to the fore forefront the obligations of changes in education and the advances in the profession. And I tried to depict this idea in the next slide where we can see that there is a roadmap. In fact, FIP has very recently launched uh, a, a project looking at roadmaps for the different regions. Um, and there's a roadmap to support both the education and the advancement so that we are in alignment. And in this roadmap, we have visions, we have a strategy, which is shared by the educators, students, and professional partners. And therefore, this is of utmost importance that we all are together sharing these experiences through platforms, um, international platforms, but also through the publishing aspect. And this is uh, uh, the, the biggest value of having mediums, uh, including pharmacy education journal, uh, so that uh, both the professional partners and the educators can share their experiences. And in fact, I welcome very much the vision shared by Ian earlier that um, in the next years, um, Pharmacy Education Journal will also 
extend to also have the thematic as aspect that will include the, the, the practice and the science publishing from, from our young researchers. So once seeing the, while, while appreciating the why we need to publish and when we need to publish so that we share innovation, we can look in the next few slides, if we move on to the next slide, we can start looking at what has been published and what can be published and what is the value of this publishing. Um, this is an example of a very early, uh, considering the, the history of the journal, this is a paper taken from 2013, so mid through the, 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 the life cycle, um, where it was at the time presenting, it was one of the early uh, papers sharing an experience of how competencies in pharmaceutical regulatory sciences were being built in through the teaching and pharmacy laboratories in, 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 in our institution. Um, going back now, looking now at what is happening, we are seeing that pharmaceutical regulatory sciences are becoming, are actually, an important competence that our pharmaceutical workforce is being equipped with to be able to navigate the changes that are happening in the complexity and in the innovations of the technology of the medicinal products that we are sharing today. So this medium of sharing these examples is very relevant so that we can embrace change. The other examples that we have seen um, and uh, in, in, in publications and why it's important to publish is, for example, looking at the experience from COVID. Um, we do, we can take um, some positiveness from our experience in COVID because there were some aspects that had to change, uh, both in pharmacy education as well as in practice as a result of what hit us. And uh, in fact, many journals, including pharmacy education, dedicated special issues to capture those examples. And I captured four areas that you could see which were very much highlighted um, uh, also through the experience, but even in the publishing aspect domain. Um, the vaccinology, not only whether we should vaccinate and whether we should educate our students to, to be able to become providers of the vaccine administration, but also in the science of vaccines. Medical devices, um, PPEs, self-testing kits took center front in the fight against the COVID disease. Digital literacy, both from the medium to react to our patients and how to connect, but also from the education side, how we could uh, literally leverage what digitalization gave us so that we could uh, go on with the education process. And finally, um, crisis management. Um, it was a test of time of uh, looking at how the profession itself and educators and students could navigate a, a crisis. And we, we learned and we, we reflected on the need to, to uh, boost uh, aspects, both in education and in practice, that can support crisis management. And in the next few slides, I will share some more recent publications that are actually taken from these lessons learned and how the journals um, and the publishing gives you access to look at what others are doing, share also your experience, and by doing both, sharing your experience, uh, having the opportunity of having young uh, researchers share that experience and also learn from the other publications. It is in, in tandem improving what we can deliver to our services. And this is an example, I've already cited the importance of vaccinology, which has a very broad spectrum, not only in whether we should be vaccinating, but also how pharmacists have been and, and, and have shown their value in public health in getting across the message of understanding the science for the risks and benefits. And finally, the pharmacovigilance of which this very recent paper, hot off the press from pharmacy education uh, reports on uh, in terms of pharmacovigilance and adverse drug reaction reporting. There is also the issue of teaching models, which I share um, in the next slide uh, where we have we have seen in, 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 in when we were public when we were looking at publications how everybody was trying to share the lessons learned from the remote learning which we had to go through 
because of COVID, but then the experience and how we are taking this forward, the hybrid. Now we're talking about Hyflix. We have also seen the sharing of experiences and how we could learn to innovate then in our own uh, settings uh, to innovate how you can build up a remote aspect in placements or to also maintain laboratory sessions and, 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 uh, and uh, provide a high flex environment. The other aspect uh, also, which is which I thought is very, very blaring in this, in the pharmacy education journals is um, the one which I share in the, in the next slide, which looks at the importance of looking outside pharmacy and looking beyond um, the, the pharmacy education in the first degree program the collaborative teaching and practice, uh, having sharing examples of how to extend and emphasize the importance of interprofessional education, but not only. How are we, are we expecting to have an interprofessional practice if we are not starting um, and strengthening and taking up the opportunities of interprofessional education? And this is where what um, this is another area that I see um, that I have seen and have had also the personal experience to share um, in, in, in the publication. Uh, we are also nowadays looking at um, how to use simulation um, in our in our teaching settings um, in the undergraduate, but also in the advanced practitioner stages and how we can incorporate the simulation using our colleagues from other healthcare professionals. In the next slide, um, then I have the, the other facets of what publish publishing gives um, to the individual person, to the institution, to the group of researchers and to the profession. Um, because um, one of the values of, the, of, of publishing is that you're connecting with the international community, how um, uh, the world becomes a small village, we can say. Um, and this is actually what, um, what is the experience by of sharing in an international platform. And this is for, probably one of the strongest facets of pharmacy education in that it's giving this opportunity of the globalization for education and practice. And um, on another note, therefore, it is also an opportunity to share what is going on in different regions of the world uh, with regards to the science of education and practice. And um, this, uh, this is a collaboration that the European Association of Faculties of Pharmacy has had for the past years, where um, there is the opportunity to provide visibility to the work that is being done in the region. Um, and in fact, um, these are, um, this is a snapshot of the abstracts that have been that are regularly shared on an annual basis um, through the pharmacy education journal um, and we are now looking forward actually to share um, in the next few weeks the 2022 um, proceedings of um, the EAFP conference and this is a way to expose further the European context at a global level. So um, Finally, to conclude, um, the power of sharing our experience is also how it is being transmitted um, from some work, from the work being carried out by a group of individuals, which is being catapulted out to be shared with a very big network of colleagues uh, in the pharmaceutical scenario. And that momentum then, that bigger momentum, is a way of how all of us as a community can actually be a contributor to the transformation of the profession, which um, actually relies on merging the science, the science of education, the science of practice um, within the group of people. And that is why we need this capacity building and the sharing of experience in the context of an environment that is very highly supported in the publishing world of uh, supporting research and innovation. And therefore, I believe that um, by providing submissions in, 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 and publishing and sharing ideas, we are contributing to this cycle um, and being part of the advancement and transformation of our own profession.
So I'd like to thank you again for giving me the opportunity to share these ideas and surely a happy anniversary to pharmacy education and congratulations to all the team at um, pharmacy education and FIP. And we look forward to the next um, adventures and the next innovations in pharmacy education. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lillian, for sharing uh, how important it is in publishing in pharmacy workforce fields. Um, I can imagine like how we can learn actually from each other, how, how we can reflect from each other and how we can connect with, with each other as well when we publish in, um, in this field. So thank you so much. And I really like the metaphor that you mentioned previously about the art and also the publishing. So thank you again for sharing. Um, and I will now move to the next slide uh, where I will share a video from one of our editorial assistants, uh, Timelein Awolola Omolayo. Um, she will be sharing her experience in being the editorial uh, assistant of a pharmacy education journal. So I will um, open the video now. Hi, everyone. My name is Aurora Timile Omolayo, and I would like to say that being a part of the PEJ team has really helped me to meet amazing people, to think outside the box, and also to improve on my research skills. And it has also exposed me to various things, various information happening in different aspects of pharmacy practice all over the world. I'm so glad to be part of this team. Thank you. Happy celebration. Thank you, Omolayo, for sharing the experience. Uh, and as she said, um, for being editorial assistant in PEJ helped her to think outside the box. And yeah, thank you so much for celebrating this with us. And uh, let me uh, introduce uh, our next speaker, our senior associate editor, Pharmacy Education Journal, um, Associate Professor uh, Jennifer Marriott. Um, Jennifer, uh, thank you so much for all of you have done with uh, PEJ and it is it was a really amazing experience to work with you and thank you so much as well for your time for today uh, to deliver a presentation about the steps from submission to publication. Let me uh, just read through your um, biography. So Jennifer was the director of um, the Bachelor of Pharmacy course at Monash University from 2008 and 2012. And she was also responsible for the development and conduct of the Bachelor of Pharmacy program in Melbourne and Malaysia. And she has been uh, president of the academic section of FIP, a member of the FIPET executive committee, and also leader of the FIP UNESCO unit win project. Jennifer, uh, I would like to invite you to come to the floor and the floor is yours now. Thank you, Shirley. And again, congratulations on PJ. It's been fantastic to be involved with everyone and with the journal over um, a number of years, both for, as a person who has published and from the other side, looking at what you do on the um, prior to publication. So my talk is about steps from submission to publication and a few little tips as we go through. So next slide, Shirley. So I'm going to start prior to submission because I think a lot of people um, get very enthusiastic, write their article and then think, where can I put it and to send it to someone that they think might be willing to publish their article. But in fact, success starts earlier. And in fact, if you look at the first step, which journal are you going to submit to? First, look at is this the appropriate journal? Now, the name of this journal says it all, pharmacy, education. But you'd be surprised how many other articles get submitted sometimes just in the hope that it will be accepted. So first of all, the, the first step is to check on the website of the journal. What are the submission requirements for this journal? Next slide. And if you look at this, you'll see the sorts of things that um, the journal um, has on the website regarding what you submit and the scope of the journal. And you can then look at what are the instructions for authors. 
What types of articles? How many words do you need? What is the format that you need? What is the referencing style you need? If you get those things right at the beginning, you've got more chance of your article being successfully published. Next slide. So this is just from the website. So it's the submission requirements and you can see there, there are links to um, the sorts of things that you need, the where you, what sort of citations, what sort of references you need and links to the author guidelines and to the competing interest guidelines. And you need to look at those things before you submit. Next one, next slide, thanks Shirley. Next, next one, next one, there. If you look at what, fine, that, that will do fine. So the next step then is to make sure that all your authors meet the authorship criteria and to make sure that your manuscript is correctly formatted with all of the separate sections that the um, the journal requires of you. Many of our authors are early career authors, people who are um, just really submitting their first or maybe um, early, um, early on in their careers. And I think we've alluded to the fact that we, whilst most of the um, publications come from people whose language, first language is English, we'd like to encourage a lot more of authors whose language isn't English. But a tip for you is if English isn't your first language, before you submit, see if you can find someone for whom English is their first language and have them read it through. They will then help you correct the grammar, the spelling, and that will mean that your manuscript is more readable and is more likely to uh, be successful um, throughout and have a shortened editorial process. And make sure that you reference properly. Make sure that the things that you put in your manuscript are appropriately referenced and referenced according to the journal style. Next slide, thank you. So this is the review process. This is a peer review journal. And that means that when you submit your article, we're going to send it out for review. So the first step in that is for the managing editor to look at what's been submitted and see, does it fit within the scope of the journal? That's the first stage. If it looks, if the abstract and the manuscript looks like it's going to be within the scope, then the editor will, the managing editor will then assign a senior associate editor like me. So when I get um, an indication that I've got a new um, manuscript that needs to be looked at to say, is this appropriate to send to review? I'm going to look through it. And I'm going to look through that article and I'm going to say, is this actually about pharmacy education? Is this ready to go to review? And if it is, then I'm going to assign an associate editor who's going to see it through that review process. So I'm then going to send it on to the next step. So the next step is for the associate editor to find some reviewers. Now we've got a big bank of people who review for the journal. They're all people who work in our profession. They're all working in academia in who will then look at your article. And they're going to find some reviewers. So the, the, scene, the associate editor is going to find some reviewers. Now, this is a hard step because the reviewers are people who are working, they're not paid, they're doing this on a voluntary basis and they're busy people. And if we do this, the next step is for, to send it out, or sometimes the reviewers will say, I'm sorry, I can't review this article. And it will mostly be they're busy, they've got other things that they're doing, and therefore they will say no. 
And that means that the associate editor has to find more reviewers. So it's sent out again to the next lot of reviewers. And this causes um, a bit of a time delay. So if you say for the first step from, from when I see it to when I assign, for when it's submitted to I see it, and then I assign associate editors, that might be two to four weeks. When the reviewers are then invited, it might take another two to four to six or more weeks to get two independent reviewers to review that article. And then they're given six weeks. They're given six weeks to review that article and if they need to, maybe a little bit more. So again, we're looking at a build up of time between when you press the button to submit and when you get comments back. The next step is after they've said, yes, we should look at this article, they will either say, accept it as it is, it's wonderful. Doesn't happen often. They will say, no, I'm sorry, this article really isn't up to the journal standard. Now that doesn't happen often because we try to um, help young authors through the process. So it's, a, it's an education for the authors as to how to actually write an article that can be published. The main reason for um, rejecting at this stage is that um, it's not really within the scope of the journal. It looked like it was, but it really isn't. The next stage is then for authors to be advised of the decision and what amendments they need to make to their paper, because that's the most common decision, except with amendments. This process again, when you get the, the um, reviewers comments back, you need to look at them carefully. Sometimes the comments are made because <clears throat> the person who's reviewing the article couldn't quite understand what you meant, what you did, or what your results meant. And so they will ask lots of questions. They're not meaning to be critical or um, in a point from the point of view of saying, this isn't good. What they're saying is, please tell us more. Please make this clearer. Please explain what you did. And sometimes this, um, the, you will answer your first lot of amendments and then you might get a second lot. And those second ones are because your explanations have now brought up further questions. And again, just go through carefully. Usually these are the questions, these are the answers on a separate document will make it very clear what you've done and what you've changed and why. And if that process requires even two or three iterations of amendments, your manuscript will be stronger and more accessible to the others that you want to read it. And then you get to the completed all of the amendments and then we move on to the next stage. Next slide, thanks, Shirley. So at this stage, my tips are, and you will have heard what I'm saying through the, um, the presentation, make sure that you, you've chosen the right journal, that your manuscript fits within the, the scope. Make sure that, it, that you can check for spelling and grammar before you submit, because it will mean there is less confusion when the reviewer is trying to read through your manuscript. And the third one is the one that I think I find when I'm reviewing is the thing that makes it hardest for me. And that is not keeping all of your sections of your paper separate. The introduction is meant to be where you set the scene of what do we already know about the topic that I'm going to talk to you about? And why did I do this piece of research or why am I presenting you with this information? The methods should only be methods, not, not 
methods plus a few results or methods plus a bit of explanation. The methods should allow me to see exactly what you've done, in what order, so that if I needed to, I could actually duplicate your research in another area. And then results. Your results should only be results, not methods and results, not discussion of results, just results. And then your discussion needs to put what you've actually found in the context of what we already know. And that means you need to go back to the literature and say, what, was, what did we already know about this topic? Did someone do similar research in another country? Has there been research done in a similar way in another pharmacy school, another medical school? Or is it absolutely unique and no one has ever done this before? This is where you need to reference other research and put your, um, your findings, your results in the context of what we already know. So it shouldn't just be your interpretation of your results or your opinion. It should be backed up by good referencing. Next slide. So the final process, it's, you've done all the amendments, it's all good. Then it goes to the copy editors, that group of nice young ladies we saw earlier. They will then typeset it and send you a proof. And it's called a galley proof. And it's for you to check that it, everything's um, as you expected it to be. This is not the time for you to put another paragraph in. This is just checking to make sure that, that things are clear. There may be some queries. Um, it's for you to make sure that there aren't typographical errors. Um, and some clarification may be required and may be requested um, by the copy editors. But no major changes at this stage. And then finally, publication. And we keep copies of all of the original submissions, the reviews, the revisions. They're in a file that's there. And I think that that's really important to know that if there are any queries, we can go back to what was originally submitted. So at this stage, you can congratulate yourself that you've been published. Next slide, please, Shirley. If you look at the timeframes, what I've said to you before about the delays that are inherent in the process of having peers review your work, you'll see that sometimes it's taken a long time. But if you look at the, the um, 2022 slide, you'll see that the times, you will see that we're getting a lot faster. And that's because we have more senior editors and we have more reviewers. So if you're asked to review a paper, make sure you can do it quickly, but remember that you learn from that process. You learn from seeing what mistakes other people have made so you don't make them yourself, what makes a good paper and how this, the process helps you become a better author and how it helps you become more more published because you know what you need to write in an article. Next slide, please, Shirley. So I've talked about reasons for delay. I've talked about the fact that um, if you don't, um, if you don't submit an, um, a manuscript that's um, in the proper format, it causes delays that will mean your manuscript takes longer to get through the system and that there are more amendments to be completed. And sometimes those amendments need to be, um, we give you four to six weeks, but the quicker you get those amendments done, the quicker that process to publication will be for you. And I think that that's probably, where I am, be patient. Start at the beginning before you submit in making sure that um, your work is appropriately formatted and then sit back and wait. 
and you will be a published author in no time. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for this presentation and walking away, we, uh, taking out or through those uh, slides and like uh, taking our hands in each step from submission to publication. You made uh, the, the participants like the idea of getting some revisions because everyone doesn't like it. But what you have explained make everyone like to have revisions because as you said, this is just to improve the quality of the uh, paper. Thank you, Jennifer, for all the work. We're so happy to be working with you and we're so happy to be guided by your useful tips. We go now to another like testimonial from our one of our um, uh, team member, Emmanuel Lanzaribi. Uh, Emmanuel has said that PAJ has done a great job in showcasing research to the world and getting to this 20 year milestone simply signifies that there is so much more to look out for the future. So uh, her work with PAJ strengthened her critical thinking, proofreading skills, and the ability to pay attention to details. Constantly learning new methods and skills has made Emanuela work with PAJ and production team worth it. Thank you, Emanuela, for all the work you're providing. We're so happy to have you with us on the team. Now, now I would go to our uh, next speaker. Uh, we have Professor Shane Dessel. Um, professor Dessel is a professor of social and behavior pharma, uh, pharmacy at Tulu University in Cal uh, California. Shane is joining us too early for him. So uh, we thank you a lot, Jim, uh, Shane, and we do appreciate that you accepted our invitation and your enthusiasm to be presenting today with us. Shane is the Editor-in-Chief for Research in Social and Administrative Pharmacy and for Exploratory Research in Clinical and Social Pharmacy. Shane's history in publication speaks by itself. We will give you the floor to talk about the, the importance of contributing to the pharmacy practice and education, and we are happy to listen to your presentation within the coming eight to 10 minutes. Thank you, Shane. Thank you, Marwin. Uh, I am delighted to be here this morning, and 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 that is uh, evidenced by uh, my joining this event at three thirty in the morning. Uh, I, I I and and I was delighted, uh, and Marwin and Ian were very kind to invite me to to participate in this celebratory event today, uh, and they were also kind enough to, to to offer me the opportunity to 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 film myself and 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 uh, still be in bed right now. But uh, I passed on that because I wanted to be here in person. So the first thing I would like to say is uh, happy 20th anniversary, happy birthday to pharmacy education. That's why we're here. And that's the first thing that I wanted to express. So uh, Shirley, next slide. Uh, so as, as Marwan indicated, I, I, I'm going to talk to you about the importance of, of uh, publishing and, and, and what that does to, to us as academicians and as scientists and even as practitioners. Uh, there's, a, there's a compelling uh, set of literature dating back from the 1960s and 1970s on, on concepts called interdisciplinary consensus and scientific paradigm. Uh, and it was initiated by Thomas Kuhn in the 1960s. And, and Kuhn said that there are some disciplines that are sort of standing in place, while there's others that are making precipitous and very quick gains uh, through each decade that passes along. Uh, and, and, and they talked about this concept of interdisciplinary consensus, which is the, the degree to which a certain discipline, like say, for example, in this case, pharmacy and pharmacy education, the extent to which we agree on the priorities that we teach, the priorities that we, that we research, and even the methodologies that we utilize to, to actually study the phenomena of interest. Um, and so the, the, the disciplines, uh, some disciplines that have been around a little bit longer, some of the more that were associated typically with hard sciences are, 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 are those that we think of as having more achieved their scientific paradigm. Uh, and there's a tremendous number of implications for this. Uh, Shirley? So when you, when you lack consensus or you have not achieved your scientific paradigm, evidence suggests that the, the constituent practitioners, the constituent scientists within that field have more difficulty in publishing. 
They have difficulty in pro acquiring promotion and tenure. And we know for a long time that this was the case, even though our discipline's relatively new, but those that are in pharmacy practice, social and behavioral pharmacy, uh, those that were in pharmacy education, really having a more difficult time getting published. Uh, there were relatively few venues to publish at the time, back in the 80s and 90s, before pharmacy education was birthed. Uh, there was a little bit of scholarly enemy or sort of a, uh, you know, a disinclination, sort of a, a negative or pessimistic view about the progress that we were making. Uh, people in, in low consensus disciplines which was arguably the case for pharmacy and which I'm talking with you about today, or more, have a more challenging work environment and even make less money and are, and are less uh, career mobile than others that are in a, in, a, in a discipline that has achieved or is in the midst of achieving a scientific paradigm. Next slide. So this is coupled with the fact that we have increasing complexity and stress on us as academicians and researchers, as well as practitioners. Um, we, have, we have fewer and fewer resources that, that, are, that are more heavily constrained. We know that the, the budgets of uh, large uh, government national funding organizations in the US, like the Food and Drug Administration, like the National Institutes of Health, has been budget issues with regards to the World Health Organization, uh, as well as large philanthropic foundations. Uh, so the resources are, are constrained, which makes it more difficult for us to get grants, to get funding for our projects, uh, which decreases the amount of time that we have to engage in scholarly work and to ultimately publish that work. So we have this, this, this these pressures. We also have uh, increasing teaching workloads for those of you who are in practice, and I know a number of you are in practice who, who are on this with us today, um, you know, with modern technology, uh, which is wonderful in many ways, but we're also glued to our phones, we're glued to our iPads, uh, we're, we're practically working almost 24 hours a day. Uh, we're checking emails as soon as we get up at five in the morning, we're checking emails at eight or nine o'clock. And so work-life balance is a, is, a, is a big issue for those of us who are trying indeed to publish. Shirley? So productivity and research still matters. In, in fact, it matters more than ever. Uh, in contributing to the scientific paradigm, there, there are several factors that are important for, for, for promoting productivity and research. Um, we, we, we're trying to promote an, a culture of productivity and research, which pharmacy education has done in its last 20 years, and providing this additional outlet for young practitioners, for budding scholars, budding scientists, to be able to take the thoughts that they have in their head onto the practice field, onto typing up manuscripts, on to disseminating knowledge that helps us all advance the, because you know, it's, it's this knowledge, it's the dissemination of research that helps us, it helps advance all of us, it helps advance society, it helps advance the individual patients that we serve, it, it helps advance the profession. So pharmacy faculty, including those in workforce, including those that are not necessarily fully faculty, but maybe they're part-time, maybe they're adjuncts, maybe they're practitioners. So when they are in the midst of a profession that is evolving like ours, with journals like Pharmacy Education helping us to evolve, they, are, they achieve self-actualization, they achieve career satisfaction. Shirley? So cynics believe we're marching in place. You know, I remember when I was in pharmacy school in the 80s, I was in my PhD program in the 1990s. And all I heard was, you know, oh, pharmacy hasn't changed in the last 20 years. It hasn't changed in the last 40 years. And we keep hearing that. And certainly a profession takes a while to evolve. You can't expect these, these massive precipitous changes to occur just over the span of a decade. I would, I would argue that in spite of the fact that we've yet to achieve that scientific paradigm, we've been making great strides. Practice has moved from drug use control to pharmaceutical care to medication therapy management. We have a greater number of outlets to publish. 
like RSAP, as Ian mentioned, but all, like pharmacy education and many others. We have a greater impact of those papers that are being published. We have journals now that, that are increasingly becoming a part of the, of the important um, publishing landscape that are, are achieving ever higher impact factors that are, I mean, you saw the, the, some of the data that are shared with you by, by Lillian and Marwan and, and Ian to, to lead us off showing that the, the thousands to tens of thousands of downloads of some of the initial pharmacy education uh, 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 pub articles that were published just, just within a few weeks to a few months after, after they hit publication. So we are not marching in place. We are actually making great strides and I'm so excited to, 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 to be involved in all of that with you. Shirley? And education is at least partly responsible, if not largely responsible for, at least as a term we use in the US, I don't know how much it's used around the world, is for driving the bus. Uh, ad advances in pedagogy, because we are, we are educating the future leaders of the profession. We are educating students who are eventually gonna become the practitioners. They're gonna become that, that workforce that, that, that Catherine has talked about when, when she kicked out things off today. Um, we are, it is us that are responsible for advancing education. You know, we, we can't, you know, education involves just like pharmaceutics involves, like ph pharma pharmacology evolves, like pharma ph pharmacy practice evolves. And we can't keep teaching uh, our brightest and our best and our future students the same way we were 30 and 40 years ago, even the same way we were five and 10 years ago. So it takes educators who are out on the forefront we're out doing research and research in pedagogy and workforce to be able to advance us to the stages that we are reaching now, Shirley. So as such, leadership in the profession, future practice change, and ultimately the benefits uh, of our advanced practice for our patients rest with our documentation and our scholarly productivity. As I said, when, when you publish findings, you contribute to future evolutions in healthcare. You are contributing to the future education of healthcare practitioners. You are advancing pharmacy practice. You are advancing social and behavioral pharmacy. You're advancing pharmacy education. And ultimately you are advancing society as a result of these contributions. So publishing in the area of workforce, publishing in general, and contributing to that scientific body of knowledge, to that scientific paradigm, to that whole concept of interdisciplinary consensus is paramount to, abs to what we do as pharmacy educators and pharmacy practitioners. And pharmacy education through its birth 20 years ago has helped us make these strides and realize this vision. So thank you again, pharmacy education and FIP. Thank you very much, Sen, for sharing the importance of contributing to pharmacy practice and education. Um, and um, it, is, it was a really, really um, good inspiration. And uh, I, I, I think uh, most of us here perhaps just want to basically to take like uh, a blank of paper and perhaps to think about how we can do uh, research, how we can contribute to research and how we can publish. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for all of the encouragement and um, and um, and sharing um, this. Uh, and thank you again as well for all of the collaboration uh, with the P Pharmacy Education Journal and your support uh, in uh, publishing, um, in increasing publishing, uh, particularly for the young uh, researcher. Thank you again. Um, okay, so uh, now I will move to uh, our uh, next speaker, um, which is uh, Judy Lynn Niede um, Solidum. Unfortunately, uh, she couldn't join us today, but she's kindly uh, recording um, her reflection as a reviewer. And I will uh, share the video, but before that, I would like to share um, her, her uh, biography first. So Judy Lin um, is a professor at the University of the Philippines Manila College of Pharmacy. She is also our associate editor in pharmacy education, and she is also a part of the global 
hub um, lead for the DG11, which is uh, impact and outcomes. And she's also a member of uh, pharmacy technician advisory committee. And I will now um, open her video. An awesome 20 years to the Pharmacy Education Journal or PEJ of the Federación Internationale Pharmaceutique or FIP. It is my joy and extreme honor to be here with you to share my experiences as a relatively new associate editor and reviewer of this prestigious journal. Well, when I was starting, I had some SOS moments related to procedural things, especially when articles were submitted and forwarded to me for processing. Those in higher positions were very helpful and would guide me through my difficulties. So I would like to thank them for that. Thank you very much. It took some time for me to get used to managing the work. And it is a blessing to be part of this team since I was able to further harness my evaluation skills on materials that need to be analyzed for best fit um, for this journal. See, as articles arrive in my virtual room, I get to browse through every one of them and exercise fair judgment as to which ones would be forwarded for review, accepted, or declined. Once it is forwarded for peer review, I would definitely wait for the recommendations from the assigned reviewers. Sometimes some reviewers will decline due to problems in their workload, but that's okay. Um, I can always uh, assign new reviewers and pray that they will accept to work. Should the reviewers say that um, revisions are necessary, then I would request such from the author or authors. They will go through the comments or suggestions, fulfill all if they agree, then return the improved form to me or respond for clarification as necessary. The process would be a chance for exchanges between me and the authors for the improvement of or refinements of their write-ups. Copy editing comes next and then production. The last two stages are no longer on my domain as uh, associate editor, and I've been briefed on that. So I no longer have any experience on that except to assign a copy editor to the article. Well, I find peer reviewing for PEJ exciting since I get to learn while reading all of the submissions. I also get to share my insights on varied studies related to education in the pharmacy profession to hopefully improve papers. I always feel that I am engaging with brilliant pharmacists all over the globe when I read and comment on their works. It may be asynchronous interactions, uh, no faces, no voices, but still with the inputs and responses being exchanged communication and professional linking are still achieved. The virtual platform, though with challenges, is pretty amazing, seamlessly connecting all of us with each other. Through all the reviews I did, I can say that I almost always comment on the recency of literature being cited, congruence of the objectives with the conclusion, and sample size computations, rigors of qualitative analysis, spelling, grammar, and referencing. But of course, there would be detailed comments dependent on the specific articles being reviewed. I know that when I peer review papers similar to all other reviewers for PEJ, we put our utmost best and utilize our analyzing eyes to always offer the best reads for everyone. Well, even in this journal, the PEJ, the mission of FIP is apparent, that of supporting global health by enabling the enhancement of enhancement and advancement of pharmaceutical uh, practice, sciences, and education. The Pharmacy Education Journal, published by FIP, is open access, free to publish, peer-reviewed journal, which makes it accessible to all parties interested in all aspects of pharmacy and pharmaceutical-related education, training, and workforce development. These kinds of materials are important to the pharmacy profession since what we read in PEJ are scientific studies with primary data and first-hand experiences from all over the globe. Calling from the journal information itself, it says that PEJ provides a research, development, 
and evaluation forum for communication between academic teachers, researchers, practitioners in professional and pharmacy education with an emphasis on new and established teaching and learning methods, new curriculum and syllabus directions, educational outcomes, guidance on structuring courses and assessing achievements and workforce development. So all of this you can actually read from the journal um, itself. Okay. So it publishes reports also on research and innovation in all aspects of professional pharmacy education and training, case studies, country studies, innovations in the laboratory and professional educational practice, workforce issues and development, uh, reviews, reports on information technology in education and reviews of current literature. That being said, what we get from PEJ as readers would enrich us definitely as scientists, educators, and players in the pharmaceutical workforce. Now, for the information of everyone, PEJ is listed in EBSCO and indexed in the Emerging Sources Citation Index or ESCI, so Web of Science, Embase, and Scopus. Now, for rank increase and promotion purposes in the academe, I know that this information holds water. Personally, PEJ means a lot to me. Having recounted my experiences related to my work with this publication, it is right to acknowledge not just my happiness to be part of the team, but so much more my privilege and honor to render my humble service to fulfill my tasks that will ultimately pass on relevance to the globe. More importantly, I have found a new home in the PEJ FIP. Once again, happy 20th birthday, PEJ. And let me say, long live in the Filipino language. Mabuhay, PEJ. We would like to thank you, Judy, for this like uh, wonderful video. Um, let, allow me to, to be biased in this celebration and say that I'm loving this celebration. I'm loving what we're doing. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for your interaction on the uh, chat box and on the Q&A. Um, we're trying to answer all your questions because we are mindful of the time. We will be now going to Associate, Associate Professor Rudy Hindra. Uh, Rudy Hindra is an Associate Professor at the University of Rai Department of Chemistry in Bikambaru, Indonesia. Uh, he works mostly in digitalization and pharmaceutical information systems at the Division Committee of Indonesian Pharmaceuti Pharmacist Association. We have been collaborating with Re uh, Rudy and the IAI, the, the uh, uh, Indonesian Pharmacist Association, in uh, many special issues. And we would love to give the floor to Rudy now in order to talk about the perspective of publishing a special issue with us at the AJ. Rudy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maran. How are you? Thank, uh, thanks for having me here. And thank you for PEG and FIP, FIP uh, to give this floor uh, for IAI uh, as a collaborator. So uh, I, I would like to uh, talk about our collaboration. And then firstly, uh, this is uh, some uh, perspective uh, special issue uh, coming uh, from uh, II, maybe in the future, uh, PEG having a special special for pharmacy profession that is professional behavior and ethical aspects. And then the second one, the needs for more practice oriented education and solving complex problem in a practice workplace. And then uh, I would, uh, we were very happy that uh, in the previous uh, talk, uh, PEG will broadening uh, the aspect in the pharmaceutical science and practice uh, that will be uh, good for uh, Indonesian uh, pharmacists or researchers to publish their uh, work in the PEG. So next, please. Yes, uh, as I mentioned before, we have been uh, collaborate, uh, collaborating for almost three years. So every, uh, every year, uh, uh, Indonesian Pharmacy Association or II has a uh, uh, hold the annual pharmacies uh, conference where the uh, the out the output of the conference uh, the researchers can uh, publish their work. So uh, as as you can see in this presentation, uh, there are two uh, issues has been published. The first. Uh, 
2021, and the other one is a 2022 uh, IA special edition. Uh, hopefully this year we 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 can uh, we can publish uh, another uh, special issue or regarding to the AI conference. So next, please. Yes. So uh, so this is the timeline that uh, uh, how we work or how uh, how the collaboration happens. So uh, first is. Uh, we have a, a like kind of agreement between the PAJ and the II uh, teams. And then uh, the next uh, step is manuscript submission uh, to the committee, where is uh, the, the, the participant of the conference submitted to the, the committee. And then uh, blind peer review process uh, from the uh, Indonesian pharmacist expert. And then the manuscript revision uh, after uh, the revision uh, submit uh, submitted, and then we send uh, all the manuscript to the PAG team. And then I'm very uh, thankful for the uh, PAG team for uh, the work, and then for the editing, and at the end of, uh, of the publication. Uh, on our behalf of the Indonesian Pharmacists Association, uh, we wish you happy 20th anniversary. Uh, we hope that PAJ will achieve greater success in the future and become a leading and prestigious pharmaceutical journal. And the collaboration between PAJ and AI will continue in the future. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Rudy. So um, welcome. thank you for being mindful of the time. We try to answer all the questions on the Q&A. We, we don't have a lot of time to now to, to go back and to open a discussion, but we are so happy for this uh, celebration. I would like to check if uh, our editor-in-chief, Professor Ian Bates, wants to have a final uh, uh, comment or a final address to, to the participants before going to some event uh, uh, announcements by Shirley. Professor Bates. Thank you very much, Marwan. May I thank all of our presenters today for their different perspectives and overview, and of course, for their uh, collaborative uh, work uh, with us over in FIP and uh, the journal. Your contributions are very, very much appreciated. Thank you. We have had a number of uh, nice discussions and uh, questions and answers and uh, comments in the chat group, which we will keep and uh, maybe form a little uh, feedback uh, paper, briefing paper that we can send out to you, uh, all of you who have registered for this uh, webinar today, just for a little update and some more information for you um, on a, on a uh, document so, um, from us. Thank you to Marwan and uh, to uh, Shirley for helping to arrange today's uh, webinar. It's been a great privilege uh, to have you all with us um, uh, here today. I'm looking forward to the next 20 years. Uh, please spread the word about this uh, publication route, this dissemination route. Please uh, encourage your faculty to look at education, training, development, workforce as a serious research topic. Thank you to Shane for a, a brilliant uh, exposition of why it's so important. Um, and get involved, please. Get involved with groups like Lillian's group, the European faculties, get involved with the new uh, African forum that's being developed by FIP. The um, Southeast A Asia and uh, Western Pacific have some super forums uh, for you to get involved with, et cetera, et cetera. So please get involved um, without education, development and training, there will be no workforce. And without a workforce, there will, can be no uh, uh, pharmaceutical care provision. It's, it's a vital uh, circle, it's a vital link uh, that we must bring closer and closer together. Thank you all so much. We'll be in touch with you with some follow through and 
um, some summaries of what we've done today. Thank you, Marwan. Thank you. Thank you, um, Shirley. The floor is yours to announce some events coming at FIP. Uh, thank you very much, Marwan. Um, I would like to encourage all of us uh, to actually join um, the second FIP Pharmacy Practice Research Summer Meeting. I was there, I think like three years ago before COVID and it was a really amazing experience. So I would like to encourage all of us um, who PhD student or supervisor to join us in this uh, conference. Um, this program will offer interactive workshop and also keynote sessions and also networking event. And um, one thing that I would like to highlight here is um, to. Uh, to encourage all of us to submit an abstract and the abstract will be will be published in a pharmacy education journal as well and the event itself will be on um, 4 to 5th July 2022 so uh, please register before 30 uh, June 2022 and the next uh, Com upcoming events that I would like to highlight is our congress which is um, which will be uh, organized in Seville Spain from 18 to 20. 2nd September. Uh, the team is Pharmacy United in the Recovery of Healthcare. So join us in this event and the registration and abstract submission are, are already open as well. And uh, it will be also published in Pharmacy Education Journal. Uh, check our website in seville2020.fit.org. And I would like to thank you again. Uh, and if if uh, you would like to uh, look at our future uh, FIP digital events, feel free to um, to browse in events.fifth.org. And I would like to invite perhaps all of our speakers today um, to congratulate PJ and happy uh, happy 20 years, PJ. I will stop sharing my screen now. Marwan, over to you again. Close. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. And thank you for the celebration. We would like to thank all the participants. We know that we had... Um, uh, people from uh, PAJ family uh, being uh, like uh, participating and watching this webinar. We would like to thank all our speakers uh, to be with us. We really appreciate you being here in the webinar and your contribution to the PAJ. Uh, the team at PAJ would like to uh, to invite you all to be uh, to get involved with us. Submit your manuscripts pharmacy education, workforce, and now broadening the scope, having also some part of science and practice that will be accepted uh, in our journals while broadening our scope. Thank you, everyone. Um, so uh, this is uh, a, a good celebration for PAJ. We're happy about this. This will motivate us to work more and more and to help in the adv advancement of pharmacy workforce. I would like to... Uh, to ask if any of the panelists has any final thought or um, or else we can we can say bye bye if you can all open your cameras please so that maybe we can everyone can can see can see the panelists and happy anniversary paj thank you everyone thank you bye bye